as a widow. She died in 1835, in fact she, she nearly made it to being Victorian. Uh, she was there a long time and sadly she outlived all six of their children and none of them had any children, so there are no direct descendants of James and Elizabeth, sadly. Uh, the extended family, yes, but not of them directly. It's worth having a little bit of a think about the recreation process itself. What is it? Why? What are we trying to achieve here? There's a number of possible reasons for making a replica of a historical piece. You might want to provide a replica which can be used for display, particularly if the original is too fragile or something like that. Uh, you might want to investigate the production methods and the materials that are used. You might want to see what it would have looked like when it was new and how the piece would have looked 250 years ago when it was newly made. And you may also want to preserve the skills of the people who were making items in the historical period. And in this particular case, there's something of all four in that. Uh, it's intended for display. I very much wanted to explore the techniques and the skills of the historical period. And to get a feel, particularly, for how the piece would have looked when it was new, because what we see today is inevitably faded and tarnished. And it's rather good to get a feel for what it might have looked like. We, we sometimes look at historical periods of embroidery and textiles, and we think we're seeing what it was like, but in practice, the colors have faded, the, the silver in, uh, particularly is uh, oxidized and tarnished. We don't get a clear idea of what it looked like at the time. <coughs> There's also part of the exercise which is interesting is to see how um, modern materials affect the process. Because some of what was used at the time is still available, some of it is not, and we have to use as close a replica as we can. In terms of the project itself, I was working particularly with the Captain Cook Memorial Museum in Whitby, uh, in North Yorkshire, and particularly with the Chairman of Trustees, Sophie Forgan. Uh, and it was Sophie who originally suggested that I have a go at replicating the Cook waistcoat in particular. I was looking for a, a project to have a go at, and she had seen the original, which is in the collection of the State Library of New South Wales in Sydney. They have quite a collection of Cook memorabilia there, and part of it is the unfinished waistcoat that we were focusing on. And Sophie was aiming for a, an exhibition which she has on this year in the museum in Whitby, um, entitled Fashion and Fibres, Island Dress in Polynesia. And this focuses on some of the fabrics and materials and, and styles of dress which were used in the Pacific in the time when James was exploring that part of the world. So she suggested that I have a go at re uh, reproducing the waistcoat, particularly since it's stitched on Polynesian fabric, which James brought back from his second voyage. So it's actually using fabric from that part of the world. It was also there, the idea was to recreate it and to complete it, because this particular waistcoat was never finished. Um, James died on his third voyage, and Elizabeth stopped work, sadly, never actually completed the waistcoat. So it would also give us an opportunity to get a feel for how it might have looked had it actually been finished, had he returned to wear it to court, which was almost certainly what Elizabeth had planned. The image on the board there that you can see is uh, actually from the State Library of New South Wales, and that shows the left front of the original waistcoat. You can see the embroidery here, down the front of the waistcoat, and this is the pocket flap. Um, sadly, you can also see some rather spectacular ink stains, which uh, somebody managed to get on the waistcoat in the, 18th, in the 19th century, that, so the museum was not responsible. Um, they were already on the waistcoat by the time the museum acquired it for their uh, Mitchell collection. But that uh, gives you a little bit of a feel for how it looks at the moment, and I've got some more photographs shortly. 
The waistcoat itself is stitched on what's called tapper cloth, which is a Polynesian bark cloth. And the original tapper that Elizabeth used came from Tahiti. It was a gift from one of the rulers of Tahiti to James when he was on his second voyage. Uh, it's stitched uh, on this beaten cloth. I've got some samples here if you want to have a look later. It's made from mulberry bark, paper mulberry <coughs> bark. So it's interesting material. It's, it's sort of halfway between fabric and paper. Quite strange stuff to work with. There's a linen backing cloth um, for the embroidery, which you can actually see <coughs> on the picture here, which shows the back of the waistcoat. This edge here shows you the tapper cloth, and then here's the linen backing fabric, and then the back of the stitching um, on the original waistcoat. It's stitched with silk thread and with metallic threads, um, and you can't see them on this side, but in these areas here you've got silver spangles, sequins. It's not completed, we've no construction, we've just got the flat pieces, We've no buttons or anything in evidence, uh, so some of it at least was guesswork along the way, hopefully educated guesswork, but I'll show you what I came up with anyway. <coughs> Elizabeth received news of James' death and stopped the work on it. And there's some interesting speculation we can make as to, to why she stopped when she did. Was she intending to do any more work on the waistcoat? Uh, she, collect, she kept it along with a number of other pieces and eventually they were put on exhibition uh, around about 1870 I think it was uh, and then the New South Wales government bought a, a large quantity of pieces that were exhibited and they were taken to Australia and eventually found their way into the Mitchell collection at the State Library of New South Wales. Sadly it's not on display much uh, unfortunately. Um, I think it's a little too fragile and they don't want to risk it. Um, so I had to see it from that collection which was rather good. So what I applied for funding for particularly uh, was a research visit to go to Australia and New Zealand to look at the originals. Um, I obtained photos of the photographs of the one we saw earlier but it's much better to go and look at it properly if you can. So I applied to the Society of Antiquaries and they were kind enough to give me some money at the Janet Arnold Award. And I also received some money from the Norman B Trust, which is a charitable trust based up near Whitby. And they allowed me to visit Australia and New Zealand last May and June. And it was a fairly spectacular few weeks out there. And I was able to visit the museums and explore the items that we were interested in. First of all, the State Library of New South Wales, the original waistcoat, and that's it in its box. I was, um, to coin a Yorkshire phrase, slightly gobsmacked at being allowed to get up close and personal with something quite so unique. Um, I was also able to go to the Maritime Museum in Sydney and look at the map sampler, which was also stitched by Elizabeth. That's a little later stitched around about 1800, they think, uh, in memory of her husband. So by that point, she'd been a widow for nearly 20 years or so. Um, but that's in the collection of the Maritime Museum, and I was able to have a look at that as well. And then we went over to Wellington to look at the third piece, which is attributed to Elizabeth, and that's in the collection of Te Papa Tongarua uh, Museum in Wellington in New Zealand. And this particular waistcoat, which you can see in the third picture there on the uh, on right to your left, isn't it? Um, that one was finished earlier and was believed to have been worn by James, um, although it has been altered later. So that was something that I was able to use to get an idea of fairly boring things like his chest size. Because if I was going to make a copy of the waistcoat, I'd got to figure out how big he was. I've actually now examined all of the embroidery which is attributed to Elizabeth. Those are the three pieces which she is believed to have done. Um, and that was fairly amazing. And I learned a huge amount from that visit that I wouldn't have learned from the, or hadn't learned from the images that I'd obtained. 
uh, measurements, details of the colours. I didn't realise till I got there that there were actually three shades of each colour rather than two. It looked like two from the images. Um, some idea of the alterations that had been done to the tape up a waistcoat, uh, construction details, what sort of buttons she might have used, and all sorts of things like that. And that made very clear to me, and I think to anyone who wants to know more about it, just how important it is to look at, to look at the original item, rather than trying to work from images and photographs. And I got a much better recreation of the waistcoat as a result of the visit. I also got a fairly spectacular holiday out of it. <laughs> um, but the, the, the main purpose was the museum visit, and that was fantastic. I've also been able to visit several museums in the UK to look at waistcoats from a similar period, and also to look a little bit at um, other items of dress, uh, which was researched for this lot, as you can see on today. Um, there are a number of examples of waistcoats in the museum collections in the UK, um, particularly from the 18th century. There's some lovely collections of 18th century costume out there. And it was fascinating to look at the waistcoats from the 1770s, uh, the period when Elizabeth was stitching the waistcoat that, we're looking, that, that, that we were focusing on, and to compare how they were. And it was interesting. Um, ladies, we think we dress fancy. That's got nothing on 18th century men. These waistcoats were stunning. Uh, silk embroidery, metallic embroidery, bling everywhere. They were, and bear in mind that what we're looking at now is tarnished. They were amazing. That's a piece from the collection at Gawthorpe Hall, from the Kay Shuttleworth collection. A cut down uh, pieces of a waistcoat, but that's the lower hem. And you can see just how spectacular that one would have been. There's one from uh, Leeds Museum's collection, also again 1770s. Uh, rather lovely ribbon effect around the edge of that one, all embroidered. Um, the uh, silk thread, there's some sequins on that one as well. Uh, this one, you can't see a lot close up, but this one's a, a German piece from the Embroiderers Guild collection uh, from, at Embroiderers Guild House in Walton on Thames. Uh, that would have been glorious in candlelight because it's got silver uh, thread all over it. Uh, now it looks sort of mucky grey, but it would have been stunning at the time. And then this is one from the Leeds Museum collection. Slightly simpler waistcoat, this one, on linen rather than silk. Most of the others were stitched on silk of one form or another. They're all stunning, but it's interesting that, as you'll see, there's more embroidery on these than there was on Cook's waistcoat. And speculating a little on why. Why is, is it less elaborate than some of the others? What was Elizabeth thinking about when she was doing it? The waistcoat was almost certainly intended for court wear. Had James returned from that third voyage, he would definitely have been invited to court to meet George III. He'd already met him after the second voyage. And he might well have expected to have been given a knighthood for his work on exploration. So the chances are this waistcoat was intended for James to wear to court. It's a relatively simple design. You can see this is the, the on the, the image we've got here. Um, there it is. This is actually on the, the, the neckline. It's the edge just on the side of the neck. Um, you can see that this is the, would have been silver. Here's the silk embroidery. And then you've got a, a silver and green wavy edge there that would have been the edge of the fabric. It's a relatively simple design if you think back to the photos we looked at just now. Was she planning any more? Was it intended to be more elaborate? There's no sign on the original of any unstitched markings. I had a good look at it. I can't see any sign of ink or pencil marks or anything like that that indicated 
there was more embroidery that she didn't complete. It's possible that she de devised a sort of staged process. I can see a certain amount of logic as a sailor's wife to doing things in stages. Finish one stage, then if he hasn't come back yet, mark out the next bit and stitch that, and then you know do it in phases like that. So whenever he arrived back, there'd have been a level of work more or less complete. There's a possible logic to that. It might have been a class issue. As the wife of a post captain, he was, and then a post captain himself, they were at that point up the middle class. But they were both from, at best, lower middle, or if even working class backgrounds. James's father was a farm steward. Elizabeth's parents had a pub, basically. Um, so it may have been that they didn't want to seem to be above their station in some way. They were also both heavily influenced by the Quakers. James was trained by a Quaker sea captain in his apprenticeship, John Walker of Whitby, and Elizabeth was actually fostered by a Quaker family for the first five years of her life because the pub was fairly frantic and her mum thought she'd be safer out of the way. So, and all the descriptions of James in contemporary accounts all describe him as a plain man. He didn't like elaborate dress. So it's quite probable that he said he didn't want anything, anything too fancy. He may also have been thinking that a fairly plain design could also possibly have been worn with his uniform, where a very elaborate fancy one like the ones we saw just now would have looked wrong. It may just have been to show off the exotic tapa cloth, this strange new Polynesian fabric. We'll never know, sadly, but it's interesting to speculate as to you know, why she might have done this and what her thinking was. In terms of the stages of the process, uh, from what I could see from examining the waistcoat, it looks as if she did the outline first, then the silver met uh, metallic stuff, the scroll work, then the silk embroidery and the spangles la last. We've no information on how she was planning on completing it, uh, we can get some idea of the size from the embroidered front edge, but beyond that, we've nothing really to go on. Uh, there's no evidence of any buttons surviving. There's, there's no fabric with it, with button embroidery on or anything like that. So, some of it at this point, in terms of the completion, had to be educated guesswork, which was quite an interesting process. We do know that James was six foot two, which was tall for Georgian times. Um, chest size, I tried various places. I did try Jeeves and Hawks round the corner on Savile Row, uh, but sadly their archives only started in uh, 1785, I think they said. So unfortunately that was some years after James died. Um, I also inquired at Greenwich Maritime Museum because he was an officer there between the second and third voyage. I wondered if by any chance they'd got any records, but sadly not. So I had to base it on the Tepapa waistcoat um, that he wore, according to all the stories, but was all, that was altered later. And if you look at it, there is evidence of alteration on the waistcoat. We don't know who by. Was it by Elizabeth? Or was it someone else? Not sure. But it did look, it was with the cook extended family before it went to New South Wales. So I think it's unlikely that it was owned and deliberately altered by somebody else. My theory is that it was actually altered for Rear Admiral Isaac Smith. Now he was Elizabeth's cousin and he was a protege of James. He sailed with James on the Endeavour voyage, the first voyage. Um, he was one of the midshipmen on that voyage and I believe was actually the first European to set foot on the east coast of Australia. Because James said, go on Isaac, you go first. Who's going to turn that one down? Um, and she, Elizabeth and Isaac, both getting older, neither of them with any family and cousins, they live together in their old age. And to me, that's a logical person that Elizabeth might have altered the waistcoat for. Um, sadly, we've no records of Isaac either. 
And there aren't even any portraits, or at least if there are, I haven't managed to find them. So if anybody knows of a portrait of Rear Admiral Isaac Smith, I would love to know, because I haven't found any at, uh, at the moment. Whoever it was altered for was four inches shorter and probably about four or five inches stouter, <laughs> judging by the, the alterations that were made. A little bit about the fabric. Tapper cloth, it's called. It's made from the inner bark of the paper mulberry tree, Brucinetia papyrifera, for those of you who are anoraks and like the Latin names for things. I'm a biologist originally, so I tend to go for Latin names, I'm afraid. Um, it's a common fabric in Polynesia. It's used for clothing, for wall hangings. Certainly it's used more for clothing in that period. It's obviously a bit less nowadays because they've got access to other sources of material. Um, interestingly, there's no tradition of stitching the um, tapper cloth. There's no embroidery on it. Certain amount of stitching just to hold the bits together, but mainly it was painted or stained or printed. Um, they haven't really got anything much in the way of thread or needles. They had some bone needles, but certainly no metal ones, and they hadn't any fibres that they could make thread from. There was no cotton or silk or anything like that. So they didn't stitch it. Um, whether it, how it would have lasted in the British climate is a good question, because our climate, sadly, is not what they have in the Pacific. Uh, Pacific climate would be wonderful, but it doesn't work. Um, and the one problem with tapper cloth is that it's not woven, it's actually beaten, uh, so it's sort of glued together with the glue that's in the fibres anyway. So it tends to fall apart when it gets wet, sadly. Um, I did try a few little experiments, and I've got some of the pieces here if you want to have a look. Um, I tried sticking some in a cold shower on the principle that that would simulate a rainstorm, uh, and tried washing some with a little bit of warm water and soap, but it doesn't like it. So, in practice, the fact that James never came home and never wore it is probably what allowed the waistcoat to survive. Because if he'd worn it and they'd had a go at washing it, it would have been a bit of a disaster. The original cloth I got, well, the cloth that Elizabeth used was from Tahiti. I ended up getting mine from Tonga via mail order from a supplier in Hawaii, which was quite entertaining. They'd, I'm told by the chap in Hawaii that they don't make it in Tahiti anymore, sadly. Um, it did amuse me because it took me about three quarters of an hour with a couple of emails backwards and forwards to make sure I got the right type of tapper cloth. And then having ordered it online, it took three weeks to come. And it took James three years. So, you know, how we moved on. The tapper was different. It's not as smooth surface. It's rougher textured than Elizabeth's tapper. Um, there are patches of glue and patches where there's been a big hole in it, so they've stuck a patch on the back and you've got two layers of fabric and things like that. Um, I was able to find bits of tapper that hadn't got too many patches and holes in for the waistcoat when I made it. Interesting stuff to work with. Whether it would have actually been popular if um, James had survived and come back to war wearing his waistcoat at court is an interesting question. But given the weather problems, I suspect not. I think it, it would have been a, an exotic feature but it would have taken off. Those two pieces on there, by the way, those are just some modern pieces of printed tapper, just to show you how it's normally used, if you like. <coughs> Excuse me. In terms of embroidering the waistcoat, I was able to get the pattern from the New South Wales images. Uh, I had them printed off full size, traced the pattern, and then pricked and pounced the tracing paper. Uh, those of you who have not come across those techniques, basically what you do is you go along and you put, put little holes all the way along the lines of the design um, and then you pin that to the fabric and you brush powder through and it goes through the holes and leaves little dots all over the fabric and you then join up the dots. It's a boring job, I tell you. When you've got something this big, you're pricking a lot of holes. <laughs> but we got there. 
And then I, I was able to draw on the tapper cloth in pencil. Because it's close to paper in, in style, I was able to just use a pencil to join the dots up. So that worked quite well. The stitches are fairly simple, uh, but typical of the period. Uh, there was tambourine, which was very popular in 1760s, um, 1770s. That's basically stitching with a little fine crochet hook, effectively. And you, you push that through the fabric, grab the thread and pull it up into a loop. And you end up with something that looks a bit like chain stitch. It's a lot quicker than chain stitch. Uh, there is also chain stitch in there and long and short stitch. Um, it's a silk thread, a single strand of silk thread that was used. And I did the same. Uh, the original thread that Elizabeth used is what's known as an S-twist. That's just the way the, the twist goes on the thread. Mine was actually a Z-twist, which was twisted the other way, but um, Elizabeth had used Z-twist threads on the tape apple waistcoat, so she obviously had access to both. And the particular range of threads I used, which was from a firm called the Silk Mill, um, had a colour range which allowed me to match Elizabeth's colours very closely, and they were much the same size. So I felt that the fact that the twist was the wrong way was a small um, problem that we, we, we could get over that one. I was able to match the colours from the back of the waistcoat, which was good because there were much, much less fading on the back, so we could get a real feel for the original colours. The metallic thread used was what was known at the time as wire. Uh, nowadays we call it passing thread. Um, it's slightly different from modern gold work threads, if any of you are into gold work embroidery, um, because it, the thread is twisted more tightly around the core, the metal strip, um, and that means that when you stitch through the fabric, you don't strip the metal outside of, off the thread. <coughs> Excuse me. So it was um, much easier to stitch with. And then the silver spangles used were, um, there was silver. As far as I could tell, it was silver. A little bit difficult because of the tarnish, but I think if they'd been silver gilt, gilded on top of silver, they wouldn't have tarnished as much as they did. And in practice, gold thread and gold spangles wasn't, weren't really used at the time. Not in costume. Not of silver, but not gold. So almost certainly silver thread there. And that's the embroidery in action, as it were. This is um, working on the right front of the waistcoat there. That's the lower edge and heading up the front of the waistcoat. Uh, both the metallic thread and the spangles I got from a firm called Benton & Johnson, who are one of the few suppliers that still make um, silver-plated spangles rather than sequins. Uh, the spangles are made uh, by twisting silver-plated wire onto a, a, a rod. Uh, to make something that resembles a spring. Then you cut along one side, so you end up with sort of little jump rings, and then you squash them flat. And so you've then got a flat piece of silver-plated metal. And you can tell the difference between a spangle and a sequin, because a spangle will have a tiny notch somewhere around the edge, where the two ends of the wire meet, whereas a sequin is complete. And I've seen those notches on Elizabeth's waist, um, work. So they were definitely spangles. <laughs> Working out the pattern size, having finished the embroidery, was the guesswork bit. And I was able to use three sources there. The outline of the original embroidery gave me a length. It gave me the, 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 the shape of the front edge and the position of the pockets but it didn't give me any idea of the width of the pattern piece or the, the overall shape. Uh, what I was then able to use was a couple of other pieces. Um, that is a waistcoat piece that's from the collection at York Museum. Uh, it's an embroidered waistcoat. It's been altered quite a lot, and it's quite a lot smaller, but it does at least give me the basic shape of the waistcoat piece. So that was useful in terms of um, working out how wide to make the piece. Uh, and then the tape apple waistcoat um, also gave me a chance to do it. You can see here some of the alterations that have been made. There's a piece that's been put into the side seam. Uh, 
and there's one of these on each side of the, the Te Papa waistcoat. And then this is the armhole, which they basically just cut down into, folded the piece back and tacked it down. But by measuring that length, which was about four inches, I was able to determine that they'd actually shortened the Te Papa waistcoat by four inches. Uh, probably Elizabeth, I suspect, because I don't think she'd have let anybody else do it. It was too precious to her, I think. Um, so that gave me uh, um, overall measurements, which I could then cut down by four inches and extend the other way by four inches. The buttons, I based those on what had been seen in other waistcoats. And one that's particularly interesting is this one. This is the one I showed you earlier from Leeds collection. Um, that's the whole waistcoat. You can see it's quite similar to James's in terms of uh, the amount, amount of embroidery there. And this you can see it's got embroidered buttons here. And they were made around a wooden or card former. It was quite common. Quite a lot of the waistcoats that I saw in museum collections had similar buttons. So I persuaded uh, a friend of mine who's a carpenter and joiner and was converting my garage into a studio for me at the time to make me some nice uh, little wooden polo mitts. They're about polo mint sized as well, they worked out quite nicely. Um, to use as formers and then I really took a little bit of the design from the waistcoat to use to make the buttons and that was commonly what was done. If you look at other waistcoats, the buttons pick out something in the design. So that gave me some buttons to work with. And then the construction process. I started off making a mock-up of the piece because I wanted to make sure I got the pattern piece shapes right um, and to get the hang of the design. I used Mylene, the interfacing material, as a substitute for the tapper because that's a similar sort of non-woven fabric. Uh, linen and cotton, and tried to use the same construction process as they would have used in the 18th century. And that worked fairly well, and it's on this, uh, the front here if you want to have a look at the mock-up. Um, the process I based on research in, in books about construction of 18th century costume. It was all hand-stitched, uh, using linen and silk thread, as they would have done in the period. Um, I used homemade buckram to stiffen the front edge, which was quite entertaining. That's basically linen stiffened with rabbit skin glue, which wasn't nearly as messy as I thought it was, or as smelly. It, it actually worked fairly well. It didn't stick the house out too much. Um, and the sequence of construction is slightly different. The, the lining, if you make a, a lined garment today, if you're doing something like a waistcoat, you make the outer, you make the lining, you stitch the two together. In the 18th century, they didn't do it like that. They made the lining of the back in with the back. Then they stitched the front to it. Then they did the buttons and the buttonholes. And then they stitched the front lining in. That was the last job. And then they sort of stitched the buttonholes, you know, turned them back and catched them down around the buttonholes and things like that. That meant that that front lining could be replaced much more easily if it got marked, damaged, or whatever. So there's quite a bit of logic to it, but it did make for an interesting exercise in the way it was doing the, the differences. So there's the waistcoat. That's the completed waistcoat. Um, and the shape of it's quite interesting. He was a string bean, was James. <coughs> Very skinny guy when you got the, um, the size down. And I looked at it for a, a little while when I made the mock-up and thought, have I got that right? But in practice, if you look at the Weber portrait of James, that was done at about the same time as the waistcoat was being stitched. Around about the end of the 1770s. And he's pretty slim on that. So I think we have got the shape right there, as close as we can, without having James around to try it on. Uh, which would have been wonderful. <laughs> And that, he was, he was about 50, 40, late 40s, early 50, uh, you know, 50 when that was done. So he must have been a fairly fit guy, I think. I suppose running up and down the masts to the crow's nest and things like that would have meant he had to stay a bit fit. <laughs> now in terms of my costume, what on earth am I doing all this for? 
Well, this costume that I've got, I'm wearing today is based loosely on my interpretation of what Elizabeth Cook might have worn. Because part of what I wanted to achieve with the, the project is to do some stitching in the museum at Whitby and anywhere else that will take me on to do some stitching um, to show people what women of the time would have been doing. You know, this, this is the, the pastime they had, especially somebody like Elizabeth who was a skilled embroiderer. So it's based roughly on the 1770s, uh, what they called at the time the middling sort, middle classes, but she was a tailor's wife, a sailor's wife, so she might have had access to some slightly more exotic materials than most people would have done. So Indian printed fabric, some Venice lace for her petticoat perhaps, um, that it's, it's guess but it's my interpretation of Elizabeth. It's all made by hand. Uh, as far as I can, I've used accurate methods and materials. All the embroidery is done by hand. The only bit that's cheating ever so slightly is the Venice lace, which is machine made, but I couldn't resist it. It was just gorgeous. And if I tried to make lace like that, my niece does probably lace and she tells me how long it takes to make lace. If I'd tried that, which would have been needle lace, I think I'd still have been making my costume 10 years from now. So, sorry on the lace, but the rest of it's all done by hand. It's cotton and linen, the stomacher is silk, and all the embroidery is my own, and hand embroidered. So if anybody wants to have a closer look later, please do. So, where do we go from here? What do I do now? The waistcoat is now on exhibition in the museum in Whitby, which is why it isn't with me today, for which apologies. Uh, there it is in the case at the museum, along with a, a child's dress from the 19th century that's on tapper cloth, and a piece of modern tapper behind that belongs to a, a friend of the Sophie, the chairman of trustees. And that's in the Captain Cook Memorial Museum in Great Plain in Whitby until the end of October. They, the museum closes on the 31st of October. So if any of you are up in that neck of the woods and would like to have a look at the waistcoat, it's there in the exhibition. I've got three days planned um, in the Cook Museum to do stitching days, uh, basically the bank holidays, so Easter, bank, Easter Monday, uh, Whit Monday and August Bank Holiday Monday. I shall be stitching in the museum in costume and I'm actually going to work on a copy of the map sampler. Uh, seemed like a strategic piece, piece to have another go at. So uh, another piece of Elizabeth's embroidery. Um, and we'll see how we get on with that one. Um, I'm also doing some lectures like this about the waistcoat and potentially stitching days elsewhere. So if anybody's interested in a lecture on a stitching day, give me a shout. I have my cards with me. You can uh, please take them away. Sorry about the publicity bit. Um, and it's been suggested that what might be rather nice would be to take the waistcoat back to Australia uh, and New Zealand to compare it with the original, which is quite an interesting notion. Um, I've got to get in touch with my contacts in uh, Australia and New Zealand to see whether they'd be interested in that. Uh, and in fact, in about four or five years' time, we've got the 250th anniversary of the Endeavour voyage coming up. So that might be a strategic time to take it back and perhaps put it on display with the original, which would be rather nice. So we'll have to see how that works out. So, that, that's uh, more or less the tale of the Captain Cook waistcoat. I'm very grateful indeed to the Society of Antiquaries of London because I would not have been able to get anything like as good a replica if I hadn't had the funding from them and also from the Normandy Charitable Trust. So my very grateful thanks there. Thank you for huge amounts of support and encouragement from Sophie Forgan, the Chairman of Trustees of the Museum, and also from my husband Chris, who has put up with all sorts of mayhem and chaos, building work and all sorts in amongst all this project. Um, if anybody would like to follow a little bit more of what I'm up to in the future and keep tabs on what we're doing, that's my website, alisonmarkinembroidery.com, and I've been blogging the, the, the progress of the um, the project and we'll continue to put other stuff of what I'm up to.
And really, thank you very much for listening. And has anybody got any questions?